Uh, If you have a Bible, uh, would you open up with me to Matthew chapter 6? Matthew chapter 6 is where we're going to be this morning. If you're you're new or you're visiting with us or even uh, joining us online, we're in a series that we've titled, Let's Get Started. Uh, and we're actually bringing it to a close this morning. This has been a, uh, an intentional effort from, um, from, from the, the, the teaching of God's Word to direct 2024 towards uh, developing some spiritual disciplines and, and habits that we pray uh, lead us to become more like Christ, to form us into his image so that we can better reflect him into the world. After all, that's what discipleship is. It's becoming like Christ. And so uh, week one, we, we simply opened up by looking at prayer in Matthew chapter six, how Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, perhaps the, the, the most basic spiritual discipline that shapes and forms our hearts and souls is uh, the gift of going before our heavenly father and bringing to him not just our requests, but also you know, adoration of him, our, uh, our confession, our submission to him. We, we learned about how we pray as disciples and how we wanted to continue praying uh, in 2024. Then we transitioned over to something radically different, giving, and how uh, the act of, of generosity is a spiritual discipline that the church has practiced for some 2,000 years now, that as we let go of our things, we actually are being released from the grip of greed and how God uses uh, generosity within the church to not only fuel his mission, but also to, to form his people. And it's one of the, the ways that, that we shape our affections for the Lord as well. And then Derek did a phenomenal job last week talking to us about meditating and how we come to the, the scriptures and learn from the word of God and how we, uh, as he said last week, steep in it like tea, how it, we soak in the word of God so that it begins to shape the way we think and the way we uh, the way we interact, the way we relate, the way, way we have our, our being. And so that's the hope of practicing the discipline of meditation or meditating on the scriptures. Today we're going to conclude by doing what is perhaps the least popular or practiced spiritual discipline in the modern era, the discipline of fasting. And we're going to do that by going back to Matthew 6, which is a text that we've kind of come to again and again and again here in the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus is seeking to form his disciples by teaching them these particular practices and disciplines so that they will better reflect him into the world. Matthew chapter 6, just a couple of verses here at the the, the middle of, of, of this passage. Verse 16 is where we're going to pick up this morning. Jesus says, and when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. For they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in heaven. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. This is the word of the Lord. Have I told y'all I'm on a diet? I'm, I'm about to do the exact opposite of what Jesus says here, so, but I'm not fasting. I'm, I'm, I'm on a diet, but I do want the accolades for that. I want the pats on the back. I want the, oh, that's really good of you to do that. Like I'm, I'm eliciting some, some, uh, some sort of support group by telling all of you I'm in a diet. Actually, I'm not calling it a diet anymore. I'm calling it now an anti-gluttony campaign. <laughs> because let's be honest, I, I'm not just trying to tweak some of the things that are going in, in my gullet. I'm I, got, I had to pivot hard in 2024. The last three years, had just I'd gone off the rails. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I think the meme says these days, any pizza can be a personal pizza if you will just believe in yourself and commit. <laughs> That's sort of how I had been living the last three years. And I want to give you a quick update on how the diet's going. It's awful. I hate everything about it. The, mo- the thing I hate the most, though, is that the, the lies that the... The vegetable industry are pressing upon us that some vegetables can replace pasta or rice. This comes from Satan himself. It's not true. (laughs) Cauliflower rice is not rice. It is little pieces of cauliflower. And guess what it tastes like? Cauliflower. There's no way around it. And so I, you know, I made a big, um, I don't remember what it was now. I blacked out because it was so terrible. Oh, I made a roast recently and I usually have rice with roast. And so I was like, oh, I'm going to serve my roast on cauliflower rice. And I'm like, the cauliflower is messing up my roast. Spaghetti squash, not spaghetti. It's squash. Now it can take a veiled shape of spaghetti, but whenever I put spaghetti sauce on it, I'm like, okay, I'm eating spaghetti sauce and a vegetable. Um, and so just so y'all know, if I'm bitter, if I come off as a little bit angry and hostile, it's the food's fault. 
uh, I, I haven't had chips, real chips. Like I've had this cassava flour, it's not a chip. Uh, I want the stuff that's been stone ground. I want corn, you know. Uh, it's starting to weigh on me a little bit. Um, but I have noticed something, okay? And so this is where the silver lining to my anti-gluttony campaign shows up. I do feel better. I hate to admit that. You know, I used to grab a bag of tortilla chips, and I'd look on the back and see the serving size, and I'd be like, oh, you think so? <laughs> I can prove these people wrong really quick. I just feel better. I don't have that afternoon brain fog that happens because I did meet someone at a Mexican restaurant, and I just never stopped eating the chips, and they kept bringing them. And so I've learned something about that, that if you, can el- if you eliminate some normal habit or practice, if you, if you tweak it, if you adjust it in some way, and you give yourself enough time to sort of analyze the, the experience, to step back and see, okay, what's different now, good things can, can happen. And at the heart of what I think fasting is, especially for believers in Jesus, for Christians, is, is that sort of big idea that, that the goal is it's not a diet. I mean, some of y'all may practice intermittent fasting. I call it, I forgot to eat breakfast. But, <laughs> but if, you, if you do that, like that that's, that's a, a way of you know, pursuing perhaps better health or uh, you know, losing a couple pounds if that's your goal. But that's not what the scripture is talking about here. Virtually all, or I should say probably most, if not all, religions on the planet have some form of practice of fasting that's both bound up in their, in their calendars and in their worship. But the, the version of Christian fasting, especially the way Jesus is presenting it here, is decidedly different. Because it's not some public display of devotion. In fact, Jesus guard says, watch out for that. And instead, he says, here's how you go about it. He assumes that we are going to go about it. So what I want to do this morning for just working on the assumption that for most of us, fasting is either a, a lost practice or a relatively you know, sporadic practice for us. What I want to do today is I just want to answer some questions about fasting, specifically from this passage and a few others in the scriptures, and then encourage you, hopefully by the end, to perhaps incorporate into your spiritual disciplines and practices in 2024 some experimentation with fasting, just to see perhaps what the Lord would do with it. The first question I want to ask this morning is, should we practice fasting? Um, yes. <laughs> that's why I'm preaching. Yes, but. And that's an, the, the, the conjunction there is important. Should we practice fasting? Yes, but. So the yes comes from namely this big idea that Jesus throws out here. He says in verse 16, and when you fast, don't do it this way. He tells his disciples again in the next verse, but when you fast, do it this way. So the assumption for Jesus is that following him means fasting will be a regular practice. It'll be a, a habit or a discipline that the disciple engages in in an effort to see certain things happen in their heart and in their life. So he assumes that it's going to happen. But there's a wrong way to pursue it. There's a, there's a, a, way, there, there's a motive that can corrupt it. And we've got to be aware of that such that if we're going to engage in this, we need to do so in a way that truly reflects what God has for us. I think part of what Jesus may be even invoking here is a passage from, from, from Isaiah chapter 58. In Isaiah chapter 58, the, the prophet Isaiah is speaking to God's uh, people. He's speaking to Israel. And, and Israel had, had asked God basically like, okay, we've been going about fasting. Why aren't you doing what we, what we want you to do. Uh, in other words, if we're going to practice some form of self-denial, God, you, you need to step up and do your part of the deal. In fact, they say, it says it like this. Isaiah says in Isaiah 58 verse 3, uh, Israel, he's, he's, he's using Israel's voice here. We have fasted and you see it not. We have humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it. But then, giving the voice of Yahweh to the people, this is how God responds to Israel's request. If you're going to fast and you do it with some measure of expectation that God, you know, keeps up his end of the bargain, here's how God responds to that. He says, behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such a fast that I have chose, a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? 
Is not this the fast that I chose to loose the bonds of wickedness and to undo the straps of the yoke and to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and to bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and to hide yourself from all your own flesh? Then, you shall, then shall your light break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer and you shall cry and he will say, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking of wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. The prophet Isaiah essentially says this, uh, the children of Israel go, okay, God, we're keeping the fast that you told us to keep. Why aren't you doing great things for us? And Yahweh says, because the fast isn't about me. If it were about me, you wouldn't continue oppressing your workers. If it were about me, you would care about justice. If it was about God, you would care about feeding the poor and the hungry, clothing the naked. And Yahweh says, if you wanted to be about me, stop quarreling amongst yourselves. You wouldn't have all this relational strife. In other words, there's a way of practicing spiritual disciplines that if you're not attuned to what God is doing in all the other areas of your life, it's basically pointless. And that's precisely what Jesus is challenging here in, in Matthew chapter 6. Don't be like the, the scribes, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, who when they fast, they do it for show. They do it to get a pat on the back or an attaboy. They do it for accolades. They, they do it to have a, a sense of, of self-righteous and superiority over the other. Don't let fasting be a practice that just, you know, enhances your own view of yourself. Instead, it should bring you to your knees. As Isaiah says, if, if the fast is doing its job, you put on sackcloth and ashes, you're, you're humbled by it. So should we fast? Yes, we should. Absolutely, we should. In fact, I'm going to encourage you strongly. I'm about to tell you why you should fast, but the caveat is important. If it is merely for religious show, if it is in some way to get God on the hook for something you want to see him do, if it is in some way to, to, to beef up your own sense of, uh, of, of self-worth, then, then maybe not. Maybe take some time to, to work on your relationships, to care for the poor and the oppressed, to, to go about being generous. And then incorporate fasting when the heart and the motive is rightly aligned. That's the vision that Jesus gives to his disciples. So why should you do it then? Why should we practice fasting? Well, the first thing I think, the most obvious thing, is to simply pursue Jesus. To pursue Jesus. To, to lay off something. To lay down something. In the ancient world, it was, it was often food or food and water. But uh, in our day and age, any number of things can be set aside. We'll talk about that more in just a minute. But the hope of any fast is that in laying something aside for a day, for, for, for a week, for a season, whatever the case may be, we are replacing that with a pursuit of Jesus himself. We fast not to get something from God, but to get God. More of him in our lives, more affection for him, more of an awareness of our own sinfulness and our own need for the gospel, more of a desire to, to come under God's authority, to see his, his word root in our hearts and, and, and do something in us. Just as everything we've talked about is enhanced to this point by fasting. You want to grow in generosity? Perhaps a fast would help get you down that road. You want to grow in, 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 in your knowledge of, of God's word and the person of Jesus? Perhaps a fast will help you in that direction. You want to be uh, more intentional in your prayer life? I guarantee you, when you eliminate distractions and fast from maybe some screens for a while, you will enhance your pursuit of Jesus in prayer by practicing a fast. We fast in order to pursue Christ. Richard Foster, in his book, Celebration of Discipline, he talks about fasting. He says, if our fasting is not unto God, we have failed. Physical benefits, success in prayer, the ending with power, spiritual insights, these must never replace God as the center of our fasting. John Wesley declared, first, let fasting be done unto the Lord with our eyes singly fixed on him. Let our intention here and be this and this alone, to glorify our Father which is in heaven. That is the only way we will be saved from loving the blessing more than the blesser. The heart of fasting for a follower of Jesus is to set our affections on him, to grow in our love for him, to see us uh, develop a, a passion for, for what he loves and for what he cares for. 
Now, again, most religious traditions on planet Earth observe fasting, but they do so for a multitude of reasons, some to, to demonstrate their devotion, some to, to atone for their sins. Uh, Lord, help us. That's one of the things about the gospel of Christ that I so desperately love is that I, I don't have to give up pork in order to show God that I really love him. Like, I can still eat bacon. That's, that's a good thing. The gospel is good news, you know. But in some traditions, you give up certain things for certain seasons in order to demonstrate how devoted to God you are. But for Christians, we, we pursue fasting simply to, to get more of God. We fast because it opens us up to God. And what's kind of underneath the pursuit of Christ and the reason that we need to fast is because it promotes humility and repentance in our lives. Fasting promotes humility and repentance in our lives. It's it's a laying down of, of an innate desire, a trigger that we may have towards food or something else. That In so laying it down, we, we, we remove ourselves from the seed of being the Lord of our own life. The, the, the judge and the Savior who, uh, anytime we have an urge, have to, have to fill that need or scratch that itch. It teaches us to humble ourselves. It teaches us to practice repentance. Again, Foster's insightful. He says, fasting reveals the things that control us. This is a wonderful benefit to the true disciple who longs to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. We cover up what is inside of us with food and other, other good things, but in fasting, these things surface. David said, I have humbled my soul with fasting. Anger, bitterness, jealousy, strife, fear, if they are within us, they will surface during fasting. Now, uh, if I were practicing fasting at this season, I wouldn't tell you because that's what Jesus tells me not to do. But as I said, I've been on this anti-gluttony campaign for a minute. And let me tell you, I've learned a few things even in just that. Oftentimes, whenever I'm hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, I'm looking for chips. Uh, there's a, you, you guys know, you, you know, emotional eating, guilty eating, frustrated eating, like, oh, I'm so mad today. Where's the salsa? You know, like, it's just a, a habit that has been formed in life. And so when we choose to fast, we realize, that, as Foster says, how quickly those, those, those anxious thoughts, those uh, corrupted sins of the heart start coming to the surface and how regularly we try to suppress those things with something else with something other than the glory of of, of Jesus Christ and his mercy and grace towards us. So this this habit, this this, this spiritual discipline is meant to not just uh, cause us to see those things, but to see how to relieve those things by running to Christ instead of running to the pantry or the refrigerator or picking up our phone. The temptation is ever before us to uh, continue on in the ways that, that we've always been going and not interrupting those habits or patterns uh, because it's just easier. But when you fast, you're confronted with really what's happening in the heart, and you're able to do business with that in prayer and in repentance because that's what God has for you. When we cease uh, from something in order to pursue more of Jesus, we have space to see our own selfish desires. We have a capacity to to understand where we've gone off the rails, and then hopefully, by the Holy Spirit, turn to the Lord in repentance. Which is kind of the last thing I want to say about why we should practice fasting, to practice self-denial and self-control. Those are real things that God holds out as possibilities for a disciple of Jesus. Self-denial. Jesus says, who of you, um, uh, anyone who would seek to follow me must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For who of you can save his life by, by gaining the world? If you gain the world, you're going to lose your life. You want to you gain your life back, you give it away. And so the practice of self-denial is innate to discipleship, learning to turn from certain things and turn towards God in the process. That is, after all, what repentance is. So sometimes we practice fasting because the flesh just urges and longs for things. And we've got to demonstrate through the power of the Holy Spirit, we're not held captive to the flesh anymore. That's exactly precisely what Paul says in the book of Galatians when he says the works of the flesh are evident. He gives a laundry list of all the ways that our flesh controls us. But he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. So as Jesus would tell his disciples in John chapter 15, if you are rooted in me, if you abide in me, I will empower you. You will have these fruits emerge in your life. Any tree that is, that is abiding in Christ will bear these particular fruits. And one of those fruits is the ability to control ourselves, to, to be able to regulate 
both our, our, our emotional state and even our, our, our state of our souls before the Lord. Fasting trains, teaches, prepares, um, fosters in us both a desire for self-denial and for self-control. It's also a place where we become attuned to our neediness. If you can find the space and the capacity through fasting to recognize how quickly you respond to these innate urges within you. Because it's shocking to me. Like, I, I do so many things unthinking these days. Whether it pertains to eating or as I'll talk about in a minute, even like with technology. I was in line at the grocery store the other day and the line's moving slow. And before I even know it, my phone is in my hand. It is unlocked and I'm going to scroll. And I'm like, I've been standing here for 12 seconds. And I have this automated response like, well, I'm bored. Let's look at stuff, you know. What is that? That, That's an innate response. And fasting gives you an opportunity to go, wait, hold on, time out. What's happening here? What's going on in my heart whenever that urge creeps up? Why why is it that, you know, man, in this moment I felt a little bit lonely or I felt some shame and my feet just started heading towards the refrigerator? (laughs) Unthinking responses. Fasting gives us the space to, to, to evaluate those things, to bring those things before the Lord. To let Jesus direct us into a, a new and a better way. To be renewed by his mercy. It's not, we're not fasting because it saves us. We're fasting because we've been saved. And in so doing, God can continue to, by his mercy and grace to form us and to shape us into the image and likeness of Jesus. Fasting is just one step, one habit that we can take into our hearts and lives in order to, to, to foster the, this, this new life that we have in Christ. Finally, I would just say also, fasting is, is there to remind us of the gospel. And this isn't on your notes. Feel free to write it in. But in Matthew chapter 4, because we're in Matthew chapter 6, let me do a little quick rewind. In Matthew chapter 4, shortly after Jesus is baptized, it says he was led away by the Spirit into the wilderness, and he fasted 40 days and 40 nights. So Jesus practiced fasting in a very kind of severe way. 40 days and 40 nights, I think, is analogous to the 40 years that Israel spent in the wilderness. But Jesus goes and fasts, and when he is at his weakest... The scripture says, the enemy begins to tempt him. Three temptations that that, that the devil himself throws at Jesus. The first one, turn stones into bread, which thank the Lord, I'm not like Jesus. Because if I could turn stones into bread, I would have a problem. I don't even have to go to the fridge. I'd be like, that rock, sourdough. Where's the butter? You know, like I'm I'm fat and happy for the rest of my life. Turn stones into bread. And what does Jesus say? Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Three times Jesus goes in this moment of temptation as he is fasting. Three times he passes that test. Why? Because we're weak. Jesus goes into the wilderness to pass the test that we all failed. He goes, he fasts because... We're unable, we were unable at the end of the day to practice enough discipline to deal enough with those urges and desires. As Paul said in in Ephesians when we studied it back in the fall, we were by nature children of wrath. Our desires were utterly corrupted to the core, but God, because he is rich in mercy, made us alive together through Christ Jesus. It is by grace we are saved through faith, not by works, not by fasting, so that no one can boast, but... We've been given this privilege now of taking the resurrection life that lives within us through the the, the medium of the Holy Spirit, God dwelling within us as we fast to grow and mature in the faith and as disciples become more like Christ. That's why we fast. How then do we go about practice fasting? That's that's a big question I often get as a pastor. Okay, you've you've convinced me, give, we're supposed to do this. Should be a a regular habit and practice for Christians. Um, I've never done it before. What say you? Okay, um, 40 days and 40 nights, be like Jesus. No, I'm just kidding. If you want to, sure, but, but maybe not start there. Maybe consult with your physician first if you want to go hardcore like that. I always say pick, pick a meal or pick a day or pick a season. Pick a meal, pick a day, or pick a season to start fasting. By, what do I mean by a meal? I mean literally a meal. Um, if, you, if you want to get into the, the habit of practicing fasting for the sake of spiritual growth and maturity and for pursuing Jesus, then Pick a meal and skip it. And when you skip it, you're not just saying, okay, I'm not eating lunch today. You're, you're replacing that space and that time when you would normally do that, that, that eat that meal to, to pursue Christ. You read the scriptures. You go to your reading plan. You have a, a directed prayer time then. You 
feel hunger. You feel what you're feeling in that. And you maybe even journal about that before the Lord. You recognize your neediness and your dependence upon him. But you can just pick a meal. Or maybe you want to pick a day. Maybe you give Wednesday a go. As if it's not you know, hard enough. Let's add some fasting to it and see what God does with that in our souls. Maybe it's Monday. I don't know what your day would be, but maybe you pick a day. Or maybe you pick a season. And that's what I'm going to urge you at the conclusion today. The season of Lent, the season of fasting that the church has practiced for some 2,000 years now is upon us. Um, let's, let's start thinking about that. The second thing I would say, pick a meal, pick a day, pick a season. And this isn't just for like weight loss or for improving your health, but for the pursuit of Christ. Um, think about screens. Think about social media. Think about the distractions in your life. Because in, in an agrarian society, in Jesus' day, the, perhaps the, the biggest urge was to, was to eat. So they would often fast from, from eating. But in our day, I mean, I, I think most of my kids would probably defend this. I, if I said, look, I'm not going to let you eat today, but I'm going to take, take away your screen time. They, they, that's when they lose their mind, right? Like, I'll starve myself, but i got to get online today. You know, that's sort of the way that we operate in this world. So I would encourage you, maybe it's maybe for, uh, for a day, maybe for a, a season, you you're, you're off of some things. You're, you're learning that the remote kind of gravitates magically to your hand whenever you get bored or the phone comes out of your pocket. So maybe it's a season from screens. Maybe it's a season from social media. Maybe it's just anything that serves to distract you from what you're feeling in the moment. Whatever kind of crops up or bubbles up in your heart whenever you think about that. Replace that time spent on those things with spiritual, physical, and relational pursuits, but, but ultimately to pursue Jesus himself, to run after him, to, to follow him. Essentially, what I would encourage you to do if you're going to take up fasting in the, in the days or weeks to come is to in, in, interrupt your routine, mindless habits with intentionality and purpose. Interrupt your routine, mindless habits, the stuff that you do uncritically. The stuff that just seems to be a pattern in your life that you've never stepped back and said, okay, is this, is, is this helping me grow in faith? Is this, and I'm not trying to be a Puritan here and say, you should give up Netflix. Otherwise, you're probably going to hell. That's not what, what I'm talking about. But do you gravitate to certain things without even thinking about them, without even considering them? Uh, binge watching is a thing. We used to have binge eating. Now we have binge watching. Binge watching has become a, a thing in our day and age. And I've never finished a season of something that I kind of got enthralled with and sat down the remote and said, well, man, that was my shining moment. Like, so glad I did that. I'm usually like, I've got chip crumbs on my shirt and I don't know what day it is. And I'm like, oh, Lord, help me, you know. Maybe it is a break from some of those things, the, the, the easy pitfalls and traps that often creep up and grab us. Just interrupt your routine, mindless habits with intentionality and purpose. So when will you do it? I wanna, this series has been about calling us to commitment. I, I want folks to take a step. Do the next thing, especially as it pertains to your to spiritual growth and to following Jesus, to taking on habits and practices that shape and form our hearts and affections. When will we do it? Well, again, I already said this, but let me close with this this morning. Lent begins February 14th, and it ends March 28th. Uh, Lent beginning on February 14th is awesome, by the way, because Ash Wednesday, if you're familiar with the, the liturgical calendar, Ash Wednesday is the day where you get those ashes on your head and a, um, a, a priest or a pastor says, from, from dust you were created is the dust you, you shall return. So that's romantic, you know, like, hey, honey, let's go out to dinner and talk about our mortality and what happens when one of us inevitably is gone. I digress. Uh, so Lent starts on Valentine's Day. And it's a 40-day season reflecting much like Jesus in, in, in the wilderness where the church has just given something up, given something up for the purposes of pursuing Christ. And I want to encourage you to do that. I want to encourage you to just do, take even if it's just the next couple of days and, and, and become curious about your habits and patterns in life. Huh, why do I do that? Or if you're really daring, if you're super courageous, ask your spouse, <laughs> say, hey, you want to help me figure out what I kind of go to whenever they'll be like, oh, I know. This is what you do. You know? uh, ask your kids or kids ask your parents. But, but f do some curious analysis of these habits and patterns in your life, be it with food, with screens, with devices or whatever. And then let's, as a church, see what would happen if we gave ourselves to a practice that Jesus assumes followers of his will put into practice. What may happen if we as a people just decide to set aside some time 
in our hearts and lives, to, to, to steep in God's word, to be enriched through prayer, to practice generosity, and let, let, let fasting in some ways as we pursue Christ be a catalyst for that. What could happen? And as I just challenged our men in our, in our men's retreat over the past couple of days, let's not do this in isolation. Let's do this in community. The beauty of the body of Christ is that we can rely upon one another for support and for, 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 for encouragement, that we can look one another in the eye and say, keep on keeping on. I'm here for you. You got this. The Lord is at work in you. His spirit dwells within you. There's nothing that cannot be overcome. We have resurrection power and life within us. As we saw in a testimony of baptism this morning, we were brought out of death into life through Christ. So let's pursue that life. That's what fasting's about after all. And let's do it together. God, would you empower your people to take steps of faith towards this practice that for a couple thousand years now, you've used to form and shape your church. You've used this to, 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 to reorient our affections for you, to see how needy we are, how, how humble we should be because we're so dependent upon things to motivate us and, and to provoke us. And so God, would you in these moments bring us to repentance? Would fasting be a catalyst where people hit our knees and we come to you admitting the, the need, great needs that we have for your spirit to work within us and to change us from the inside out. And God, would this not be a religious burden that we're laying upon ourselves? Would this be a, a pursuit of freedom? Because that's what you want to do. You want to set us free from the things that hold us, be it food or devices, the stuff that is, uh, the enemy has used to, to, to capture us, to entrap us. Lord, would you release us from that? You went into the desert and passed our test. God, empower us to pursue these things such that we're shaped and formed into the image and likeness of your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.